singing of our hymn of praise, number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. of compassion and service. We have been given multiple opportunities to witness and us love. Come, let us worship the Creator who has given us life. Let us send our praise to God who knows us fully and loves us. Amen. Amen. Our opening prayer continues in the bulletin. Lord, from, from the, the very, very beginning, beginning of your creation, you breathe your love into all that you made. You gave us the breath of life and asked us to be good stewards of all creation. You placed your trust and love in us. Help us to turn again with joyful hearts to you, placing our trust in all that you have done for us. Let us be a blessing for you. Amen. Amen. Our affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed, the traditional version number 881 in your pew hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
be seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Now let us all pray together for our friends and family and the community and giving all of our concerns and needs to our God. Uh, and then now I want you to share if you have any prayer requests for yourself, for your family, or for someone you know, or for our community. If you have one, raise your hands. Yes. Keep the Jessica in your prayer and Robert Hacker, the brother of the, uh, the Linda. And also, I ask you to pray for Linda because she's going to have another cataract surgery for her. In October. Yeah, in October. In October. I thought it was coming in. Coming it week. was, but we changed it. Yeah, but it was possible until October. And please pray for the names we've just shared and please pray for the people who are suffering from the recent uh, flood in the last day. Now let's take a brief moment to uh, lift up the names and lift our prayer request for God in our silence. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus our Lord and Savior. We come not as strangers or foreigners, but we are your children and you are our Father. We thank you today for your faithfulness and your mercy and grace. You are always there when we need you. And you've never turned us away and you've never failed us. You've never failed to fulfill your promise to us and to your world. In our troubles and trials, and when the road seemed long, you've been right there with us, and you had this through, and we give you thanks and praise today. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. But most of all, we thank you for who you are and what you are. And God, please help us to follow your will through our service and fulfill your plans and purposes for us. God, we believe we are available to you because we've surrendered our life to you in Christ Jesus. And that you can do with us whatever you plan and choose. But God, we, sometimes we are all busy with the business of living in here and now. We have our plans and jobs, we have families, we have responsibilities, and we get involved in all kinds of things in our life. So help us, God, to put first things first, and help us to seek first your kingdom and righteousness, and let the other things fall into their rightful place. And help us to make the right choices in our life that account for eternity in your kingdom. God, we pray for the needs of our people today. We lift up the names you share in our prayer requests. We've all come with individual and very personal needs. 
and maybe nobody on earth knows about the struggles and burdens they are facing. But you know, and you invite us to bring everything to you in prayer. So we each reach out to you, and we know that you're already reaching out to us, and reaching out to people that we have in our mind. We ask you to meet our needs this morning, and meet their needs, and give them the assurance that you are answering our prayers. We pray for the many different kinds of physical needs and financial needs, and there are those with emotional needs, and some need healing of relationships, whatever they are struggling from. Lord, we bring them to you, because you can do something about them. Lord, we also pray for our worship service today. By the power of your Spirit, open our hearts and minds to receive your word, that we not forget the wonders you have done, nor neglect to make them known to our children, nor fail to tell them to the world. In Jesus' holy name we pray, and we gather our voices together, and of the prayer that Jesus taught us, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
the New Testament book of Luke, chapter 14. And um, it's Jesus was being followed by a great crowd of people, which often happens with Jesus. And uh, many of them were wondering how to become his disciple. Can anybody tell me what a disciple is? Do you know what a disciple is? How to put it into words? Okay, I'll tell you. A disciple is a follower of a teacher or a leader because they are liking and wanting to be like that person. And so many people wanted to be Jesus' disciples. But he was telling them, uh, let me show you the picture first, and then maybe one of you can tell me what he was saying. So here's a picture of Jesus, a whole bunch of people around. And would you read what that says? I would need a volunteer to read what this says. I don't have to make it for you. Would anyone like to read it for me? Wow, that was great, Sean. I'll say it louder for the rest of you, but Sean read it perfectly. None of you who are unwilling to give up all possessions can be my disciple. So we've got a group of pictures, a group of people here in the picture, and they're carrying some possessions. Can, oh, and a possession means something you own. If you don't know what a possession is, it's just something that you own. Can you tell me any of the possessions you see there? Just one. A necklace. Yes, a lady is holding a very nice necklace. And a sheep, of course, back in Jesus' day, there were shepherds, so there were sheep. Uh, we've got a couple more things, if you guys want to tell me what you think they might be. A treasure box. One of them looks like he's holding a treasure box. And then maybe that might be a bag of what? Could be a bag of gold. So these are all possessions that these people had. And we all have possessions, too. And we value them. Like, one of my favorite possessions I'm wearing today, it's a gold necklace that my husband Lee gave, us, gave me on our 20th anniversary. So that has real special meaning. First of all, I like gold. It's pretty. <laughs> and, well, maybe first of all, I love my husband that he gave me this. But, uh, <laughs> well, it, it's still it's something very special to me. But Jesus tells us that we need to be willing to give up our possessions to follow him. Now that doesn't mean we have to give everything away. It just means Jesus is telling us that we need to love God more than anything else in our lives. Do you guys have any precious possessions, something that you really, really like that you want to share? I mean, not, not share to give away, but share to tell us one of your special possessions. Well, did I hear something from over there? What was that? No one has anything like, I remember back when I was a kid, I had a very special stuffed animal made of white. And uh, when I was about 30, he had fallen apart so much that I really did need to get rid of him. But we have things that we really love. Should we have something you really love? Matthew? Okay. All right. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get us to understand here today is that God loves us so much, and he has given us a great capacity to love. We can love things. Do you think the thing that you love, like, I love my necklace, but I love my husband more. I mean, even if I hadn't gotten the necklace, I'd still be loving him. But this is special to me, but he's even more special. And we need to make God the most special thing in our lives. So this week, I want you to think, when you're with that one thing that you really like and didn't share with us, um, <laughs> but when you're with it, I want you to think about how you want God to help, help you love him even more than that thing. Because he is the most important. So let us pray. Dear God, Thank you for loving us. Help us to grow in your love until our love for you is bigger than anything else in our lives. 
on it. Before you guys go, I've got the coloring sheet that you all can take back and color in the pews if you want to. We've got crayons and stuff in the back. And these sort of things are what we will have for children's worship. And there is more to it for children's worship, but I just wanted to let you guys get a feel of what it would be like to do children's worship. Thank you for coming up. Here's your coloring sheet. Really important. Really important. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is Jeremiah 18, 1 through 11. I wonder if any of you have ever crafted using clay. Uh, because if you have, you know, it's really easy for things to fall apart or not go the way it's supposed to. Jeremiah is comparing the people of Israel to the clay and God to the potter. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, said the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation, concerning which I have spoken, turns from evil, I'll change my mind about the disaster I intend to bring upon it. And at another moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I had intended to do to it. Now therefore, say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doing. Our epistle lesson is 2 Corinthians 12, 5 through 12 on pages 7, 174 and 175 in your pew Bible. On behalf of such a one as I, I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast except of my weakness. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me and heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn has been given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about that, that it would leave me, but he said, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. I have been a fool. You forced me to it. Indeed, you should have been the ones commending me, for I am not at all inferior to the super apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of an apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, signs, wonders, and mighty works. Our gospel lesson is Luke 14, 25 through, 20, through 33. It's a cost of discipleship. We often think that when we have the grace from God, which is freely given, that it comes at no cost, but it did come at a great cost to Jesus. And we in turn are called upon to make sacrifices ourselves. Just as there is, there are really no free kittens, there is no free grace. It comes at a cost. Now, now large crowds were traveling with him and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. 
Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. The word of the Lord. Uh, now let us uh, offer our gifts to our God uh, to praise what he has in our life. For joining in our worship this morning today i'm glad to be with you um, and then worshiping god together um, I, I miss it that mention these names you know, in, in, as we when we share our prayer request please pray for the jasmine the pious wife because she is right about time <laughs> to give birth her fourth baby so please pray keep the uh, jasmine in your prayer 
And I'm glad that Bob Cummings, Mr. Cummings, made to the church in this morning in person. I'm glad to see you are getting better. Thank you. And please keep him in your prayer so that he can be strengthened in love, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Okay, uh, now we are looking together at uh, today's words, the Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 12. Um, in our life, we sometimes go into a difficult season. Sometimes it feels like every time you turn around, either for you uh, or for some, somebody you love, life can get kind of complicated quickly. And it seems like there's more than we can handle. And it could be a financial burden. It could be you got a bad report from a doctor for you or someone you love. And it could be like relationships are blowing up. Or maybe your job is not stable as it once was. Or it could be you are battling with the depression or any number of different things in your life. Um, and because we are children, uh, we are believers, some says that God will never give you more than you can handle. But we need to embrace the reality that God never said that in the Bible. In fact, the truth is often the opposite of the misbelief. The scripture does say, He will not let you be tempted beyond you can bear. But it never says that He will not give you more than what you can handle. That's what the Bible says in the, that's what in the Bible. And so when you just survey the entire Bible, you will see story after story of people who face more than they could handle in their life. And when you look in the book of Judges, there is a Gideon who says, I'm the weakest in my clan, and I'm the least in my family. And God, I don't have what it takes to do what you want me to do. He was afraid, and he faced what he could more than he could handle. And there was Moses who said, now I'm slow of speech, I'm not a good speaker, I'm not a good leader. And these people are wearing me out, and I can't do it all, and I don't have what it takes. And there was Esther who said, I'm very afraid. And David said, when the weight of his sin caught up to him, he said this in Psalm 38, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden, too heavy to bear. I can take it all. He said, I'm exhausted and I'm completely crushed. And he said, my groans come from an anguished heart and I don't have what it takes to handle this. So there are tons of people who had more than they could handle in their life, in our Bibles. And even our Lord Jesus in the New Testament had more than he could handle. In Mark chapter 14, when Jesus was looking ahead to what he would endure on the cross, Jesus began to be deeply distressed and troubled. And Jesus prayed like this, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. So when you look at these examples from the Bible, we see God never said and never promised that He wouldn't give you more than you can handle. Then here's the question. Why would God occasionally allow us to have more than we can handle? And I believe there are two reasons uh, that I want to share today. The first one is because there are times that He wants to teach us to depend on His presence through our problems. For example, when things start going really well and there is no problem in our life, it's e actually easy for us to forget about God. And when life is going the way you want it to, we just don't feel the urgent need for God when things are going well. And when things start going down, we start remembering God because we feel we need God. We need some help. So God uses our hard times to draw us closer to Himself. So you know what life can be like? We can be in the valley, then we can be in the mountaintop, 
Then we can be in the valley again, and then you can be on the mountaintop. There is ups and downs in our lives. And I know we can experience God when we are on the mountaintops, when everything is going very well. But I'm telling you, we can best experience God when we are in the valley. Because there is the most desperate moment for us to seek Him. Um, personally, I really experience God's grace when I feel like I'm in the valley. I best experience the presence and most of all the goodness in the valley when I'm vulnerable, when I feel I'm weak. Because it is where I realize that I'm really in need of God's presence and God's help and His grace. And I can tell you with all sincerity that I'd rather be in the valley with Jesus than on the mountaintop without Him. That's what the people in the Bible confess to, the, to our God. I'd rather be hurting in His presence with His goodness than on the mountaintop and unaware of who He is and what He's doing in my life. So if you're hurting right now, and if you feel you're weak, and you are, you are having a problem that you can, more than you can handle, please remember that that's the best chance for us to experience. God is living and active in our life. Because you are not alone. Because, and please never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. Why would our God allow you to experience more than you can handle? This may be to teach you to depend on His presence. But remember that He will never leave you and He will never forsake you as He promised in the Bible. And the second reason of why God would allow you to experience more than we can handle is to teach you to experience His power in our life. To help you experience His sufficient grace because too many of us are doing life on our own when everything is going well. But the truth is that we were not created to have all the power to do things ourselves. The Bible does say we were created to praise God. We were created to need God, to be desperate for Him. So when you recognize that He didn't expect you to handle everything, that's when you experience His power. In today's Bible, uh, today's scripture, the Apostle Paul, he lived in this truth. In Corinthians, he talked about a throne in his flesh. And this thing, uh, it plagued his life. So he wanted to go away. And he prayed three times. Uh, so we might wonder, what was the thorn in his flesh? It's most likely a metaphor to, for something. Uh, he don't, he, we don't know exactly what the thorn was. And the scholars have speculated for centuries what it was. And maybe it was a disease he was suffering, uh, such as epilepsy. But we don't know what exactly it was. But that was something painful. So he pleaded with God three different times, asking, Lord, take this away from my life. You may think he prayed for three days or just three times. But what this means is there were three significant seasons of seeking, begging, pleading, probably fasting, and maybe having churches that he planned in praying. It was a kind of ongoing process and a three seasons of praying. He just continued to pray and saying, please God, take this away. Take this thorn in my flesh away from my life. That's why Paul prayed. And there will come a time 
when we are going to find our own thumb that doesn't go away. And we are going to ask God, why don't you remove this from my life? Can't you answer my prayer? Can't you just have the depression go away? Can't you just heal my child? Can't you just fix the, the broken relationships? Can't you just help me not to be behind financially? God, can't you just do this one thing? Because I believe in you. But you know he can, he's able, but he doesn't. And you think, why would God allow me to have more than I can handle? Why didn't he just do it when he could? This is, is exactly where Paul was. God actually spoke to Paul and answered his prayer and said something that is not he expected, but powerful. And it administers to me at such a deep level, and I hope it does to you as well. God said to him, not to the scripture, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is what you need. Paul, my power is made perfect in your weakness. Then Paul started saying, uh, what at face value. I want you to watch the power in what he says. Verse 9, he says, Then I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Paul says, That is why, for Christ's sake, I am content with weaknesses. In other words, he's saying, Thank God I'm weak here. I'm content with insults. Thank God the people are insulting me for serving you. God, I delight in hardships. What did he experience? He was beaten, whipped, left for dead, shipwrecked, snake beaten. But he still says, after he experienced God's grace when he was weak, I delight in all these hardships. I delight in persecutions. When there is spiritual opposition against me, I delight in difficulties because that's the when I experience your grace best. Why? For whenever I'm weak, then I'm strong, he said. He said, I delight in this hard stuff because when I don't have what it takes, I tap into power that goes beyond my human ability to understand. I have a supernatural power of God. I have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwelling within me. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. As a pastor, now I feel like I have a lot of weaknesses to do my ministry. Uh, especially when I was newly appointed to this cross racial setting back in five years. I'm from different culture, and English is, is my second language. So many times I feel like I'm weak here. You know, when I was in, in my in the Korean Methodist church, I always felt like I was a smart man. When I spoke in Korean, I felt like I'm smart. But when, when I speak in English, I feel like I become like an elementary kid. <laughs> So I'm weak. And, but here is what I found out. It's when I have the least to bring, when I'm exhausted, when I'm discouraged, that's when the God's power works best. And it's within me. As a dad of three boys, I feel I'm weak to handle all of these things all the hardships to deal with the special needs of my kids, I feel like I'm weak. But when I turn to God and I pray, I experience His grace it's working within me again to strengthen me to stand firm in front of the, what I have to handle. Because that's what I need what is 
God's grace. <clears throat> I pray that this ministers to you that you may get to know him better when you are in the valley than you ever do on the mountaintops. You may experience this power even more real because when you are weak, a God is strong. This is what you have to believe. We were created to believe this truth. Amen. And if you are going to raise kids, there will be more than you can handle. Mm -hmm. If you are going to be involved in the ministry in a church, and you have you know, an officeship, there will be more than you can handle. I know you how hard you are working for the church. And if you are a man married to a woman, <coughs> Or a woman married to a man, <laughs> there will be more than you can handle. You're not great to do life on your own. Instead of saying, I have to be strong, I got to be strong, you got to say, I have to be weak in God. I have to be broken so that I can turn to God's grace. So I can experience God's presence and be strong in Him. I have to be depending on him, and I can get it all done myself. And I was not created to do it myself, for when I'm weak, then his strength is made perfect through me. There's something you wish that God would change it, but yet he hasn't changed it, and you are asking why, and you don't understand. Maybe you can get to know his presence, because you often better experience him in the valley than you ever do on the mountaintop. It's because when you delight in your weaknesses, his strength is made perfect. Why would God allow you and allow us to have more than we can handle? Maybe it's because he wants to draw you close to himself and to reveal his presence to you through the trials. And maybe he wants to give you his sufficient power and grace that we cannot find in this world. Because his power is made perfect in your weaknesses. Amen. Amen. Now let us pray together. Father, I pray today that the power of your Holy Spirit be real to your children as we seek you right now. Because some of us may be in that heart in that difficult season right now, but we found that sometimes it's even more difficult to watch someone we love going through a really hard season. Some of us may be facing more significant challenges, but somebody that we really care about is. Father, I hope knowing there are some people right now that are in a season of pain and I thank you, God, that you are the compassionate God who hurts with us and hurts for us. God, I thank you that you care about every single detail of the lives of all your children. So we ask you, God, that your presence would minister to those who are hurting. And we pray that as, as we call on you, that you draw close to us according to your word. I pray, God, for those who are in the valley right now, that even though they walk through the valley, that they will not fear because you are truly with them, God. We pray this in your Son's name. And all God's people can say it together, Amen. Amen. Now it's time for the communion. Please let us open the page 9. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. 
It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Holy Spirit on earth gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, 
now and forever. Amen. That you, or, that you have not already eaten and drink. <laughs> okay, now, uh, because there is one love, we who are many are one body, but we all partake of what the of one love. The bread which we break is sharing in the body of Christ. As we eat the body of Christ, may we eat in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. The cup over which we give thanks is sharing in the blood of Christ. Now let's drink it in the name of the Trinity. Now let us pray together. Eternal God, we give thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us in Christ. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit, in the strength of your presence and love and grace, to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 377. John Wesley often asks his small groups to ask each other, how goes it with your soul? And this is a wonderful answer. It does well with my soul. Please stand, shall you?
Amen. May you be strengthened by the power through the Spirit whenever you are in the valley or in the mountaintop. With, the, with His power and Spirit, go forth in peace. And may the blessings of God the Father and the grace of the Son Jesus Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit rest upon you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.